Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, Beef and Lamb and Dairy NZ Winter Grazing Webinar. Um, um, so just a quick run through this evening. So um, we are going to talk about, a bit about why we're all here this evening. Um, and then we've got three speakers um, to go through. So Tom Orchison is going to cover good management principles. So Tom is the Environment Capability Manager at Beef and Lamb. Uh, he's been here for two years and previously worked at Ag Research based at Inglemay and has also worked in winter grazing research trials. Um, Tom will be followed by Olivia, um, who will then cover documenting the winter grazing plan. Uh, Olivia is the National Extension Program Manager for Beef and Lamb. She lives in Southland, so she has a really good understanding of on-farm practices and winter grazing. And our final speaker for the evening is Dawn Daly from Dairy NZ. Now Dawn's gonna cover plan B and when you might need to initiate this and also cover some of the research that's been carried out in this area. Uh, Dawn's a senior scientist with Dairy NZ based in Lincoln, and her research focuses on profitable and sustainable future dairy systems, um, and a, with a particular emphasis on wintering. She's currently the project lead on several research projects at the Southern Dairy Hub, and lead the Southern Wintering Systems Project. So I'm just going to talk briefly about, obviously, why we're all here this evening. Um, and obviously that comes down to the fact winter grazing is in the one like nationally. Um, there's been campaigns in previous years, um, but also the recent focus that's been placed on it by the government's essential fresh water rules. Um, Beef and Lamb and Dairy and Z were able to work with others in the Southland Advisory Group to have most of these rules shifted back a year. Um, but we need to show how we're implementing these practices now and what we can do to reduce our impact. So what do we need to do? Um, well, we farmers are expected to be at the top of the game um, and have a written management plan and follow good practice at all times. Uh, regional councils this year will be increasingly monitoring and reporting to central government. Um, and writing our plans down shows that we're really serious about protecting our animals and environment, and it provides evidence to others about the good work that we're doing. So I'm gonna pass over to Tom now to cover off the good management principles. Great, thank you for that, Maria. That's a great introduction to the winter grazing. We dropped uh, off and they were having dinner with him as well. So there's two birds in the sky. So I'm just going to I'm just going to run through some of the, the principles um, around uh, good wintering management. And so the three key things to do this winter, uh, that's looking after your stock in terms of animal welfare, uh, making sure that you minimize your environmental losses. Um, and so that's in terms of reducing your nutrient uh, losses, sediment, um, phosphorus, uh, nitrogen, and E. coli. Um, and the third thing, as Marie has just outlined, is to make sure that you've got a, a, a documented um, winter grazing plan. So it's a really key part of what we're um, promoting this, this winter. Next slide, Maria. Uh, so in terms, of, um, in terms of looking after your stock, um, there, you've got to make sure that you're, you're providing adequate um, food. Um, you've got um, access to, to water and to shelter for the animals. Uh, and then making sure that you're providing a comfortable lying area. That's really important. And Dawn's going to cover that later in the presentation. Um, and also making sure that your animals are healthy on crop. So that's making sure that you've got, um, you've had a really good transition period onto the crop. And also making sure that um, you're not having any birthing, any calving or lambing um, onto that crop. Um, and making sure the animals are well off um, the crop paddock by the time they are birthing. Next slide, Bruce Maria. Uh, so in terms of the environmental side of things, uh, waterways and critical source areas um, are, are a really key part of um, making sure that they're looked after over winter. So in terms of waterways, um, you need to make sure that you've got large uh, vegetated buffers and um, the stock should be excluded from those buff areas. So we want to, we want to make sure that the the animals are kept as far away as, as possible from, from the waterways. And this should be at least, a, um, at least five meters. Um, and then in terms of when, when you're in a paddock that has got a slope, 
uh, that should be that buffer area should increase in size um, with the slope. So as you've got an increasing um, size of that buffer area. Uh, critical source areas, and I'll, in the next few slides, I'll, I'll cover what critical source areas are, just as a recap for, for anyone that doesn't know what they are. But essentially, they're those sort of areas in, um, in a paddock that can get wet. Um, uh, at, at various times where the flow accumulates and they'll have ephemeral flow or just little um, little waterways that pop up temporarily. And so oftentimes there's sort of gullies or swales um, that can be in a paddock. Um, and they can also transport um, sediment and nutrients from that paddock. So you've essentially got uh, the accumulation of flow and there's also, um, so that's able to remove um, sediment and nutrients from a paddock and also you've got the accumulation of um, sediment that will often often end up in those areas. Um, so where possible we want, would like you to um, make sure that those areas um, stay uncultivated um, and they're left with some sort of vegetation um, in there. Um, critical source areas can also include other things such as laneways and culverts and bridges and those little hot spot areas um, that where, where you can get nutrient loss to a waterway. Next slide, please, Maria. Uh, so I've just got a few examples here of uh, critical source areas. So you can see the critical source area is that little wet um, patch running through there. And so that's um, been after there's some rainfall. And so that's highlighted now, um, just to, to make that a bit clearer for you. And so those are the areas where you'll get that, um, that ephemeral or temporary flow coming through, um, coming through and helping and removing those um, sediments and contaminants. Um, there's another one on the next slide, Maria. So you can see this is a, a picture of a critical source area. So this is this paddock is still in crop, and you can see it highlighted there. So that's a little low-lying area. And so when there's when there's a significant amount of rainfall or a large enough rainfall event, that will then um, that will then uh, get wet, and you'll have um, flow moving across the land um, and overland flow um, in that area. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide, please, Maria. Um, so in terms of uh, um, other, other management things that can be done, um, strategic directional grazing is a really, uh, a really important part. And so you can see in the picture there, there's the critical source area, um, the little gully area down the bottom. And the, the idea would be to start the brakes in, in this particular paddock would be to start the brakes up as high as you can and start moving them um, towards, uh, towards that critical source area. And that basically provides, um, it starts off with a really large buffer area and then um, over, over the course of the winter, as your brakes move in, um, that will help, help make sure that the, um, that the crop paddock, um, the, soil, um, the soil structure remains open and that can absorb any overland flow. So that, and then that will leave behind any, any sediment um, and phosphorus um, behind. And then so you get the flow going um, through, through the soil rather than flowing across as overland flow. Um, so there's been some research done at this um, into this at, uh, in, at Telford, and it's shown that, that, the, um, that the nutrient um, and sediment losses can be reduced by about 80% um, if this is done, if these practices are done. Um, also, it's best to keep your soil and nutrients um, on the paddock where they're going to be productive rather than going down into a, a waterway. Next slide. Uh, there's some other great uh, wintering um, management principles um, that can be used here in terms of back fencing. So where that's appropriate, um, it's really good to back fence and do that reasonably regularly. And that helps reduce the movement of animals and remobilizing any sediment um, and soil that, um, that it'll reduce that disturbance. Um, and that will help um, reduce damage to soils as well. Uh, in terms of portable troughs, um, they're a really good um, way to make sure that the animals have, have access to clean, um, clean fresh water, um, but they do need to be put in an area of a paddock, um, where it's just, we, we call that a safe area of a paddock, where you're going to be able to reduce those, um, where, where there's no, where there's, you're minimizing the chances of um, any losses to uh, waterways or um, from those areas, so they, they're usually well away from waterways. Um, supplementary feeders, that's a great way to also um, to make sure that you get good utilization of any supplementary feed in there, but they also need to be put away um, well away from waterways and critical source areas to be really effective. Um, and then in terms of catch crops, and Dawn will cover, cover this later as well, 
um, in a lot more in a bit more depth. Um, but basically, a catch crop is, is sown as soon as you possibly can after the animals have come off. And they, they, they with the idea that the crop will, will grow, and oftentimes it might be, for example, winter oats, um, and they will go, they, they will start growing and, and soak up some of the, um, the nitrogen that's been left in the soil. And so they're a great way of reducing um, nitrate leaching. Next slide, please, Maria. So just uh, in terms of, uh, um, just to sum up there, um, we've got those good management principles. So um, the key thing is make sure you've got a, a winter grazing plan and make sure that's written down. Um, and then making sure we're looking after animal welfare, keeping the animals healthy while they're on crop and while they're transitioning onto the crop, uh, making sure they've got adequate um, food, um, water and shelter, and also making sure they've got a comfortable lying area and that there's not gonna be any birthing uh, onto, the, into those crop paddocks. Making sure that we protect those waterways and critical source areas are really important. Um, and making sure that um, to, to reducing your, your nutrient and sediment losses and also to helping um, keep um, keeping your soil structure intact. Uh, strategic directional grazing is a really great uh, management um, in terms of making sure that you're staying as far, or starting your winter grazing as far as away as possible from those um, from those critical source areas and waterways and moving towards them and then thinking about using back fencing portable troughs and safe um, supplement feeding areas and also post grazing um, you can use those catch crops uh, where they're appropriate and so just to reiterate um, yeah make sure that you've got that winter grazing plan written down a really key step uh, then I think that's us Maria um, and are there any questions Just going back to that uh, slide where the water is running through the middle of the paddock and you've got the start finished, are you then supposed to walk the cows across the crop and work them back down again to that uh, creek? Uh, yes, so it would just sort of depend a lot on on, on the paddock and, um, and you know, you, you guys know your farm's the best, um, but yeah, it could be potentially going up right up, up to the top of that and, um, and through a safe, and we wanna make sure it's going through a safe area um, to make sure that your animals go from one side to the other. Um, so you'd have to make sure that's going through a safe area or, or at a safe time when there's, there's, there's no chance of, you know, it's been really dry and there's um, minimal chance of any, um, any sediment disturbance um, and losing that um, to waterways. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've just had one come in here by text as well, um, which was how much area do I need to fence off for a critical source area? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it is. It, it really depends on, on the situation. Um, so, uh, it's it's hard to sort of generalise that with it, you know, with, without seeing anything. But, but generally, as a, as a rule of thumb, um, the, the, the usually small areas of paddock, um, it, and it could be, it could be sort of um, maybe up to five metres would be just a, a sort of a guideline um, to make sure that you're you're keeping away away from the middle of those uh, critical source areas. But it will be largely dependent on uh, on the size of the critical source areas. Obviously, uh, for larger critical source areas, it'll need to be wider. But um, a good rule of thumb would be to sort of stick around about five metres away from where you think that maximum flow might end up. Thank you. It looks like you've got off reasonably lightly so far, Tom. So um, you can keep putting your questions in there. Um, if you've got one that you did want to raise, um, we will come back to all of the presenters at the end if you've got any final questions that you want covered at the end. Um, I will now hand over to Olivia, who's just going to take you through actually documenting your winter grazing plan. Right, good evening, all. Uh, so, yeah, the next uh, few minutes we're just going to spend looking at what is involved with your winter grazing plan and some things to consider as you go about that. So, uh, Although it may seem like a lot at times, uh, the management plan is pretty straightforward. For most of you, you already have it in your head and it's just a matter of documenting it. And first of all, we have to do the planning, which a lot of you have already done. Um, you'll have started this when you went with paddock selection way back in 2020. And then 
putting in some basic information about your crop, what animals are going to be grazing it, the land, the soils, and that's information that you're already going to have, especially if you've already been done down some of the farm plan process already. And this will inform you of what aspects of your winter grazing poses the most risk, and then you'll be able to put some plans in place around it. Then you're going to sort of spell out how you're going to manage those risks and that may be as just Tom's talked about different strategic grazings, how you're going to graze the crop, how you're going to place the baler out, where you're going to put the portable troughs etc and then you can tell your plan from there. So each farm is an individual farm that you're going to plan it for your farm and each farm will be different in regards to how you do it depending on what works and you know your property the best. Then it's a matter of actually having a check and seeing what's happening and how you're going along the way. We know over winter things can change just like anything and just like all farm plans, whether it's a business plan, the health and safety plan that you regularly check on now, uh, that they are all live and they need to be maintained and reviewed. So don't be afraid that during the winter, if it needs change, that's fine. Make those plans and change it and uh, work to it and review it as you go. At the end of the day, we're trying to show our best and what work with good management practices and make sure that we're having a limited effect on our waterways. So the next, what we're going to go through now is the eight steps that Beef and Lamb has in our forage cropping management plan. As you'll see, those first few steps are really at the planning stage in terms of this plan and it's now up to you to really go out and actually do it. And that's at the the point we're at now. So this, the template you choose might not have all these steps in it. However, we recommend that you take them into account as you're going about your plan. So a management plan we will take you through today is really meant to be completed before the crop grows into the ground. However, we know that we've missed that opportunity this winter and instead want to focus our attention on how we manage our grazing of our crops and land post grazing. I'm going to go to the next slide, please. So we, this means we really want to focus on getting a risk assessment, assessment of the paddocks we've already cropped. So plan out how you'll graze the crops. So as I've already mentioned, regards to whether that's the direction, uh, where you're going to place your feed. It may be if you're just grazing sheep, how, are you going to do blocks? Are you going to do strips? Uh, prepare for any adverse events that Mother Nature may throw our way. Have a, have a plan in place in regards to where's the shelter coming from? What direction is the weather coming from? Plan out where you're going to do, what you're going to do once the crop is finished being grazed. And this is really important, having a post-grazing plan, whether you're going to be putting in a catch crop, and some of this will be covered later on with Dawn, uh, or you are going to be just waiting to be able to cultivate that later in the year. And make sure that you are, we're doing the doing it as writing down what we're going to do and documenting how we're going to show our commitment to winter, which you're already all doing. It's just a matter of now putting it, that documentation in place. And it's really good to involve your staff as you go about this as well, so that everybody's on the same wavelength and singing off the same song sheet, as we like to say, when it comes to actually doing it during the winter. When it comes to intensive winter grazing, there are some pretty big consequences if we don't do things well. And based, this is all based on the management of our crop. We could have a negative impact on our waterways and the people's connections to them. And we also have risk of harming our animals' health and welfare as well as our team. So we wanna keep things as simple as possible as well. Winter can be a stressful time, so it's good to plan ahead and make things get right. And just like anything, we don't know what's going to happen and the unexpected. If something happened over the winter and you, you had that plan in your head and you weren't able to take that out and someone else had to come in and actually do it, they'd be able to pick up this plan and see where you're heading and what you were doing as well. So you want to focus your attention on think, and think about when we're trying to manage our potential environmental impact and, what, and including thinking about sediment, where's the sediment flowing, uh, path, pathogens like E. coli, so our waterways, where are they in relation to our grazing, phosphorus and nitrogen also getting into the waterways. So thinking about those buffering zones and uh, maybe even if you haven't left a buffering zone now at this date, that you may be able to leave a bit of more of crop uh, left out and braise that last at the other end, as Tom's talked about with the critical source here, you can also do that um, to be able to limit this. 
So it's about identifying and mapping it out. So here is an example of how that may look and there's different templates available to be able to do that. Uh, as I said, you've probably already got it in here, it's just a matter of documenting it. Map out how you intend to graze the paddock. So you can see there, it's got the gate, the water lines, cultivation direction, down the bottom there, there's a critical source area and you're able to note down all those bits in it, ensuring that you've got the clean water, you've, you've covered the animal welfare side of it, we've also looked at it from an environmental aspect as well. Um, involve the staff, even get the kids involved, there's a bit of colouring in, make it a family affair, uh, try and make it winter as exciting as possible. Also, as we go about managing our environmental risks over winter, it's really important that we think about other aspects and having animals while we've got animals on the crop. And this includes making sure they've got the right amounts of feeds. And really at this time of year, just before you'll be going on to crop some of you, is really getting making sure that you've got those crop yields measurements done so that you're not taking estimates and you've actually got some real good numbers to be able to work off. You can get this usually done by um, independently, uh, your fa farmlands or your PGGs, your farm, um, farm sources will all be able to help you out with people as well. Um, but also there is some really easy guides in regards to being able to do that as a team on farm and actually having a walkthrough on a nice day in the next few weeks. On, we also want to make sure um, that you can able to do a feed budget um, and be able to assess the demands and supplement required. Uh, you can use the Feed Smart app um, for sheep and beef farmers. Uh, that is available and it's available offline as well. It can give you a really good guideline in regards to doing that. And you can check out the Dairy NZ facts and figures in the Beef and Lamb Knowledge Hub for being able to get support when it comes to measuring those crop yields and for other feed budgeting tools. So as we talked about a wee bit before, it's really important to think ahead of what you will do and if there's a lot of rain or snow and have a plan of where your stock will go. How long can they stay there if we did have a couple of days of rain? What food and water will they need and how will you monitor them? And if you can try and you can maybe try and use those drier paddocks from the start. And hopefully you've already thought about that when you've gone about that paddock selection at the beginning. And it's something to think about as you're going through winter now and you're getting around the farm that hasn't been cropped and you're thinking about where you might be placing next year's crop paddocks to actually just see over the winter where water lies in them and are they suitable? Because this is the best time of year to be able to see where that water is rather than trying to guess in the summer when you're making those selections. Uh, you can always budget an extra feed. For sheep, it's 10% extra is the rule of thumb. Um, and you might want to contact your grazier or your herd owners and check that you're both working on the same understanding. So having a really good communication line in regards to that is really um, essential um, and make sure that you're not assuming anything. And Dawn will pick up more details on this when it comes um, regards to implementing your plan B. Next slide there, please. I okay, do want to go back one, um, please, because we've actually missed one. I've been talking to the other one. Yeah, no, back one. Yep. Cool. So um, just in regards to what happens if the worst happens, uh, keep assuring that you're assessing your animal health, your body condition. Uh, you have got the option to potentially alter mob or herd sizes where it suits. So um, make making sure that you're watching your, what your stock is doing and that will give you a really good idea to their health and their comfort as well. Uh, use those feed planning tools and get additional feed if needed and shift your stock to those sheltered areas or laneways or look at a sacrifice paddock if you need. Uh, there is also uh, guide, support and guidance by calling 0800 beef lamb or 0800 4 dairy NZ when you, if you need more support and guidance in regards to your feed and you'll get a free stock take assessment of your feed plans and needs and any support you should need by calling those numbers. It's also um, a good chance to be able to let you know about the 0800 farming number. And we know farmers are working hard uh, to ensure that the animals environment are well cared for, but not everyone gets it right all the time. And this is where we're providing support. And it may be simply that you've actually gone past a property in the last couple of weeks and you, um, you might not know who they were, but you can see what you see, can potentially maybe see what their plan is. 
um, from the way they've set up their paddock. And you might be able to suggest a, a bit of suggestion in regards to actually if they put a bit more of a um, buffer zone there as they go to graze it, it'll, it'll do them a lot better this winter. And so if you see something that doesn't look right, you can call 0800 Farming. The calls are confidential and sector representatives in the local year will visit the farm and work with the farmer to address any problems or be able to advise. And anybody that's been part of that in the last couple of years has really appreciated that. Thing. And it's not a dob your, dob your neighbour in line. It is simply being able to provide support. Again, you do not know what you do not know. So just finally to finish off in regards to this section, uh, we need to keep monitoring and reviewing. Although it's something we tend to forget about, keep track on how you're getting on and what you've done to adapt your plan is really important. And it helps ensure that we're getting better every year and sharing what we've learned with others. And feel free to steal good ideas from uh, with pride from somebody else. Remember, not all photos are bad photos. You can take good photos over winter as well. And um, you may have heard of the hashtag paint a better picture. And that is also up and running again this year as well in regards to being able to share some of those really good images and some of that great work that you guys are doing. But I think you all can take a pat on the back as well. Uh, but just uh, you're doing some great work and you're working in the right direction. But now is just time to really encourage you to document it. So just uh, there's a few winter planning resources that you can um, go on. You will have seen the Ministry of Industry, uh, Ministry for Primary Industries released one as well. Uh, this has been guidance off industries, good farm planning that's been done over the years and is based on science and, and takes it in. Hopefully in the mailbox in the last couple of weeks through your newspaper, you have seen this checklist in the middle. And this is a great one just to get you started. Sit down with a cup of tea with the staff and go through this one and just see where you're at. And then there is the both the beef and lamb and dairy and Z winter grazing resources that are available through the website. And those links will be put up for you as well. Uh, you can also attend winter grazing workshops, uh, which are very short and sweet if you need any extra help. And there's a few drop-in sessions around that. So again, just check out the different events on the uh, e-diaries and on B uh, dairy and Z's events diaries if you wanting to get any more support following this evening. And I think that is me. Cool. If um, what I might do is just flip back to that slide that people didn't have a chance to look at. So the plan B will be the plan B will be covered more with uh, Dawn, she will go into that in more detail. So that I have, we have skipped over there a little bit, but yeah, that slide did not come up as I was talking to it. Yep, apologies for that, it managed to skip too. Um, so we have got a question here, is anyone else grazing deferred grazing at this time of year? Any feedback for successful management despite the last few days of crap weather? Don't want to damage the potential regrowth. Right, so that's in regards to particularly everybody. Um, so um, yeah, maybe some people can, um, if anybody is um, doing that, I think everybody will be able to see that comment. They can um, personally message each other and have a discussion there. But again, yeah, having a plan into regards to some of that crap weather and making sure that, um, that we you do have something to be able to combat um, potential regrowth uh, is a really good idea. And we do have one for Tom, but I'll just save that to till the end um, rather than bringing him back right now because we'll bring them all back at the end and cover up any final questions as well. Cool. Is there any last minute questions from Miriam? I'll give you five seconds to finish typing. I see a comment there in regards to pokey perindales, um, get higher fences, more power. <laughs> um, I think that's just your... Yeah. I'm sure that is a battle that everybody has. Okay, actually I have just had one in. So is there anyone that may be able to come out and help me with my plan? 
Uh, yes, so if you, uh, and depending what region you are, have a contact your local regional council in regards to their sustainability team. Now don't get scared because I said council. These guys are here to simply educate and help. Remember they are the ones that are getting told from the top two, they're not the ones creating half of these, um, half of the rules behind the scenes. Uh, so they're there to actually help and they, um, I know down here in Southland and Otago, the guys are more than happy to come out and actually walk people through their plans. Uh, and also depending if you're part of a discussion group or an action group, you may be able to get somebody to come and talk to you in smaller groups as well. I know a lot of catchment groups, um, they're probably one of your first ports of call. Also, if you're not part of a catchment group, uh, there's a plenty in the around New Zealand that hopefully there's one close that we can get you into um, and they'll be able to provide, have people that are doing individual support there as well. So a few avenues for you there. Perfect, thank you, Olivia. Okay, it looks like we haven't got any more questions just yet. So what I'll do is hand over to Dawn to go through the putting your plan B into action and some of the research and then any questions, just keep popping them in the chat all through um, and we'll address them all um, at the end as well. So just, just keep popping those in there. Um, uh, so Dawn. Yep, thank you, um, Maria, for that. Um, if I can have my first slide, please. So um, what I'm just going to recap um, today is some of the research that's been uh, happening or is about to happen in relation to uh, winter grazing. But as uh, we've heard from both Tom and Olivia, as part of that winter management plan is having that adverse weather contingency plan, or some of you may um, know it as your plan B. So it's really important in those um, plans that we're considering uh, the welfare of the animals, uh, the environment and people and safety in that um, contingency plan. One of the questions we got last year when we were asked, um, when we we're talking about contingency plans was, well, how do I know when to implement my plan? So uh, can I have the next slide, please, Maria? What we did at the Southern Dairy Hub last year is we uh, ran uh, some monitoring and an experiment for a month through June and July. And what we were trying to do was um, link cow behaviour and soil conditions to come up with some, some practical visuals linking those soil conditions to lying behaviour. So we had 120 uh, animals enrolled in the study and we had two um, mobs on fodder beet and two on kale. And we used some different devices. So we used um, an accelerometer around down the bottom of the um, cow's leg to tell us whether she was standing um, or lying down. And then we had um, ear tags, cow manager tags that gave us an indication of activity, uh, ruminating and eating time. And then what we did, um, the team went out and did a whole lot of soil measurements looking at pugging depth and um, wetness and a whole lot of a whole range of things and so I'll just go through briefly some of the results for what we found from that next slide thanks Maria so one of the we looked uh, as I said we had fodder beet and kale paddocks we didn't um, in this study observe any differences in the soil conditions um, between fodder beet and kale paddocks so you can see there uh, in terms of pugging depth, um, very similar, um, similar percentages of um, dry, wet and sodden and also the percentage of pooling. What we did observe uh, from this study was it was actually the paddock location that was more important than the crop type. So at the Southern Dairy Hub we have um, lower lower flats which um, are heavier soils so we uh, were seeing differences, they were um, not holding up as well as our upper terrace. So it's more the actual paddock rather than the crop that's in the paddock that, that affected the soil conditions. Thanks, Maria. So what happened in terms of um, lying time and in relation to the weather? And so on this uh, slide here, we've got a couple of graphs. So the, the top graph uh, is the days of study. The blue bars are rainfall. So you can see on day 17, um, we had a 12 mil rainfall event. And that resulted in um, a reduction in the lying time uh, across of um, all of the animals. So we'd been sitting around that eight to 10 um, hours. So on the day of rain, uh, it dropped to about six. And then the day after it dropped even further because we had follow up rain from that. So um, we had a decrease on the day of rain and the day after, but it rebounded two days later. 
And that, I guess, was indicating that um, when the conditions um, came right, those cows were tired, and so they were spending longer lying. So on rainy days, they had fewer and shorter lying bouts, but when they were in that recovery phase, they actually had longer lying bouts. Thanks, Maria. So what we were able to do from the study was look at um, the individual animals. And so for uh, cattle, the recommendation is at least eight hours a day of lying. And so that's the bottom line in the graph. And you can see um, averaging over the 30 days of the study, we had a group of animals um, with, in the red circle that were below that eight hours. Uh, and then at the other end, we had a group um, in the green circle that were um, lying, averaging lying times above 12 hours. So we were able to go back and look and see who was in each of those groups. And what we um, identified was that in that at-risk group, it was our younger, earlier calving cows. So they were calving eight to 10 days earlier and had an average age of 3.8 years. So they're predominantly three and four-year-olds. Whereas the ones that were had the longer lying times had an average age of seven years. What we don't know is whether um, is, is what's driving that. So is it the older animals are the more dominant ones? And so they're getting the feed first and then finding those good lying spots? Or is it that um, because they're older and um, maybe a little more tired that once they lie down, they lie down for longer. So that's something that we need to look into. But I guess it gives some indications in terms of the, the class of animals within your mobs that you need to be watching out for. Thanks, Maria. So in terms of um, our visual um, indicators, what we uh, observed was that a ruler to measure pugging depth, gumboot score and water pooling were all really good measures to estimate the true mud depth and the paddock wetness. So um, the gumboot score, for those that you are not um, familiar with it, it's um, used a lot in off paddock systems, but basically if when you walk across the paddock, you can still see your um, boot print once you've gone, um, then that was given a dry score. Um, if it was, um, once you lifted your foot, it was a little bit sloppy, that was wet. And if you either left your gum boot behind or your footprint completely disappeared, um, that was given a sodden score. So um, pretty simple to do as we're going through um, our paddocks. Thanks, Maria. So as I said, we did measure a lot of different things um, and there was lots of um, interacting factors, as you can see um, in this diagram here, that were impacting the lying time. But uh, surface pooling from the, the results was the most useful. And of course, this is strongly linked um, to rainfall and will also be affected by soil types. So if you've got um, a more free draining soil, then you won't get surface pooling as quickly as you will uh, on a heavier soil for the same amount of rainfall. But being able to assess that surface pooling um, is a really good indicator in terms of whether animals are achieving their lying time or not. Thank you. Next slide. Yep. Oh, next slide. Yep, thank you. Um, so I guess getting back to the, the purpose of the study in terms of what are those indicators for indicating uh, for implementing your contingency plan. Well, clearly the amount of rainfall and the number of consecutive days of rain are really um, important. So if you've had um, more than two days um, of rain, then the animals will be getting tired. And if it's not looking like um, there's an improvement in the weather, then we need to be thinking about um, implementing our contingency plan. And we can link that with the proportion of the paddock that's got water pooling. So from our study, when we had more than 17% of the area um, had pooling, then the average lying time was less than 10 hours a day. And when it was more than 80%, the average lying time was less than eight hours a day. So a couple of, um, I guess, things that you can be looking at within your, your paddocks as to um, where things are at with those animals achieving their lying times. Next slide, thank you. So we've heard a little bit about um, some of the contingency plans that are used by others from Olivia, but just probably ticking off a few more. So we've talked about the feed budgeting, um, increasing the area available. So that can either be um, providing a second break of crop in the day, providing it's safe to do so. So um, with fodder beet, that might not be the case because we might um, push them into a a area where we've got um, nutritional challenges, 
or alternatively, if we've gone through a period of um, fine weather and you've actually got good conditions behind the back fence, is just maybe um, taking that back a bit so that you've got, um, the cows have got more area to find those good lying spots. Uh, we've talked about saving the drier, lower risk crop paddocks um, and particularly any that have got shelter. Um, in the plan that Olivia showed, um, they'd fenced off an area, in a sheltered area in the paddock and they to go back to when um, the events occurred. Um, there's opportunities in terms of yards and laneways for short periods or, and if you're, I guess if you've got feed pads, standoff pads or carving pads, being able to utilise them. Um, one of the things that we're seeing uh, down in Southland, uh, farmer put in last year was uh, a grass strip uh, in his fodder beet paddock and you can see um, in that uh, photo at the bottom, basically that's sort of the breakout area. So when it was really wet, was able to open up the fence into that grass area. So increased the um, area available to them, but also a different surface for them to be lying on. And then um, there are farmers that are also using tree blocks, but we need to make sure that they're trees that are not gonna cause any issues with um, pregnancies. Thanks Maria. So just going to move now um, and do a bit of a summary in terms of catch crops. So this is um, research that's been done by Plant and Food Research and they've had a program of work uh, looking at this across um, several regions of the country. So the principles around the catch crops, uh, as Tom said earlier, is one of them's around mopping up the nitrogen that's in the urine patches. And the second one is that they can, they reduce drainage because we've got a plant growing there that's gonna be utilizing some of that, that moisture. So in terms of the key principles with catch crops, um, sowing them as early as possible, using a winter active species. So oats is better than triticale, which is better than Italian ryegrass. They all have benefits. Um, targeting minimum or no tillage, uh, but the key is to make sure that you do, um, whatever you do, you have as best as possible um, seed soil contact to get good germination. Um, targeting high plant populations and minimising weed competition so that you get those plants really going well. Uh, in terms of nitrogen fertiliser, really not required um, in the initial stages, in some areas they may be required um, after October, but because there's so much nitrogen in the soil, not required at the um, establishment. And then from the work that they've done, harvesting at that green chop silage or the booting stage um, provides the maximum yield and quality. And so there's um, on the Dairy NZ and the FAR websites, there's some more guidelines around catch crops. Thanks, Maria. So, Although it's not a silver bullet, um, it is another um, tool in the toolbox. We know that there are limitations to catch crops. Um, so the paddock gets too wet and you can't get on it. So uh, that, yeah, and it's, it's not dry enough um, until it's too late to get it in. Uh, where you're cropping on um, a milking platform, it might not fit in with the rotation because trying to get those paddocks back into grass as soon as possible, but an oats and Italian mix may help uh, here. Uh, if anybody is doing a fodder beet, fodder beet rotation, again, um, we're wanting to try and maximise um, our, we won't be able to maximise catch crop production because we need to get the, the um, next fodder beet crop in at an optimal time. Uh, for those of you that are in um, areas that are dry land areas or where water is limiting, um, the catch crops may actually deplete that soil moisture, so um, could impact on the success of the, the main crop that's following that. Uh, the other thing is in terms of when the feed supply comes in, it's not necessarily at the right time that you need it, so we need to conserve that which will add cost. And um, there have been some issues in terms of getting the right seed. So again, not a silver bullet, but definitely something that we need to consider um, in our planning. Thanks, Maria. So just a couple of um, slides to finish off around um, some work that's just starting up. So uh, through Thriving Southland, the Macquarie Hedge Hope Catchment Group um, have got a pilot demonstration looking at different crop establishments. And this sort of came out of the work that we did at the Southern Dairy Hub last year. So um, can we get, provide better conditions and have the soils hold up better if we use a different cultivation technique? So 
um, we've got the two, a couple of paddocks at the Southern Dairy Hub and then have teamed up with 11 commercial farms in Southland that have put crops in in different ways. And we'll be monitoring um, some soil, soil conditions, yields, costs, all of those sorts of things over the next uh, few months just to see what happens. And if it looks like it's successful, uh, then we'll look at um, a more uh, targeted um, research uh, in coming, coming years. Thanks, Maria. And another um, study that's being run um, by Ag Research is repeating the work that Tom talked about at Telford uh, with the protection of the critical source areas, but doing it with sheep grazing. So it's really around under understanding the impacts of the sheep grazing on those soil physical properties and contaminant runoff. So it's a three year study, um, just about to go into the second year. Uh, so watch this space and um, hopefully by the end of next winter, there'll be some really good information in terms of the value of protecting the critical source areas um, under sheep grazing systems. Next slide, thank you. So just to finish off, um, as uh, the sectors, the agricultural sectors, we've got one opportunity to get crop wintering right, and it's this winter. Thank you. Right, we haven't had any questions come through the chat bar. Does anyone have any questions specifically for Dawn before I invite the other two back for any final questions? No, all quiet. Um, so we did have one for Tom. Um, so the question was, I have a large low-lying area in my crop. I called the critical source area around a quarter and left it uncultivated. But in recent weather, the ground had water lying even outside that space. Any suggestions to manage? Yeah, OK. So um, first of all, I guess that's, that's great that you're, um, you're already protecting those critical source areas. Um, and that, so that's a really encouraging sign. I guess in terms of if the, if the wetted area is outside of that, um, it, it really, it, that'll be obviously dependent on um, slope and soil type um, and so on. So there'll be some other factors that are involved in there, but um, I guess in terms of some managements to think of is basically making sure you're keeping the animals out of out of the areas, you know, when it's actually wet, making sure you're keeping the animals out of them. Um, and then maybe considering if it does dry out, grazing, um, grazing at that time uh, when it does dry out enough. Um, and also, I guess, potentially maybe consider this This might be a, a too difficult paddock to graze. You might want to use um, consider using a different paddock, um, dependent on obviously on your situation. Um, and then the other thing to think of would be making sure that you're using that sort of directional grazing. So keeping as far away um, as you can from that wetted up area. Um, and then and then over, during the course of the winter moving towards that. So yeah, hopefully there's a few things in there that, that, that might might help. Thanks, Tom. Um, right, I've got a question for Dawn here. Um, kilograms of dry matter for kilograms of dry matter, what is the difference in potential end loss for kale, quarter beet or sweets? Uh, great question. Uh, in terms of the research that's been done at the Southern Dairy Hub, uh, we've, only, we've compared um, kale and fodder beet. And we have seen um, a significantly lower in leaching from the fodder beet than the kale, um, both in terms of total amount and per cow wintered. So, and I guess that then equates through to um, kilogram of dry matter as well. So uh, significantly lower losses from the fodder beet uh, compared with the kale. And just we have, I'm not aware of any research that's been done with Swedes, but um, just thinking around the, the nitrogen um, amounts in those different feeds, the Swedes are likely to be intermediate between the kale and fodder beet. Thank you, Dawn. I haven't got any more questions in the chat bar at present. We've got a couple of minutes. I just wondered if anyone had a burning question that they hadn't been able to type in the chat bar, if they wanted to unmute now and ask their question. 
So there is one in there that I can see around um, other crops that um, regrow. So crops that can be done, um, what species are being used, an example of plantain and rye corn. I know that Plant and Food did do some work with uh, rye corn with, and as part of their, their catch crop research. And, um, but they, I, I don't think, it, I think from memory it established quite quickly, but then didn't grow much after that. Um, and where they got the best uptake of nitrogen and the best total yield was, was with the oats. So, and I guess that's um, why in terms of the regrowing, uh, there are some people that are now using an oats and um, an Italian combination. So um, your, your Italian will come through after you've grazed your oats off. Thanks Dawn. Um, I've also had a follow-up question as well, which was the, what is significantly? <laughs> so I'm not sure if you've got the specifics in front of you there. Um, I, well, actually, I can possibly find them on my desk um, if you give me a couple of minutes. Okay, no, that's all good. Um, is there any other final questions from the audience while Dawn's finding that? So, <laughs> I found, um, so in terms of the, the leaching losses, so under the kale, uh, it was 106 kilograms of N per hectare and under the fodder beet, it was 55. When that was equated through to kilograms of nitrogen per cow wintered, for the kale, it was 5.6 and for the fodder beet, it was two. So um, at least a halving of the, the N leaching. Uh, with the fodder beet. Thank you for that. It doesn't look like we've got any more questions. Um, so I guess um, basically just to wrap up some of the key messages that we've heard this evening. Um, essentially, this, this is our year to really show our commitment to doing the best we can, um, even regardless of of what Mother Nature throws at us. Um, so it's important to follow best practices and ensure, and ensure that you have a documented plan in place. Um, Beef and Lamb and Dairy and Dead, along with other industry organisations, will continue to seek the permanent removal, the removal, sorry, of the unworkable components of the winter grazing rules. Um, and this continued good practice um, that we can show and document and prove this year will obviously give us a strong case um, for those rules. Um, now you've heard uh, about quite a lot of the resources this evening, so there's a couple of links here. Um, we will send out an email as well just with these links um, so that you can um, go through and, and pick up any of the documentation um, and information that you wanted out of that. Um, but from my perspective, I just wanted to say a really big thank you to our speakers this evening, um, Tom Orchison, Olivia Weatherburn and Dawn Daly. Um, they've certainly given us all something to think about. Um, and thank you all also um, for joining us this evening. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the recording will be available if there was something that you missed or you know someone else that couldn't come this evening but that, that wanted to. Um, and it'll be available on our website in a few days, um, as well as in any of those resources. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We've managed to finish a few minutes early. Um, and have a lovely evening. <laughs>